Hey YouTube, it's Jeff at Dark Moon Metals. It's been a couple of weeks since my last video, but May is one of my busier times of year. But I had a project come into the shop. Uh, it's marine related, it's for a boat. And it seemed to be pretty interesting, and it's some stuff that I don't really do all the time. I'm going to be doing some machining work, uh, both on the mill and on the lathe. And what I'm going to be doing is making this part right here. Now this is uh, basically an adapter. It's going to clamp around a one and a quarter inch piece of aluminum tubing that's already on the boat and it's going to allow for a 7 8 riser to come out the top for another accessory. So it should be pretty interesting. Why don't you come along and see how we get this done. So I just received the parts that I need for McMaster car. I've got some aluminum round stock and a bunch of stainless steel hardware. The first thing I need to do is work on the lower portion which is going to be the clamping mechanism that attaches the new rail to the old. I'm going to start off by cutting this into three and a half inch sections. Being that this is aluminum, all I'm going to do is take my tape measure, go to the three and a half inch mark, and just tap it with a nail set. Don't know how well you're going to be able to see that, but it does leave a big enough divot where I just lay the saw blade right on top of it. Alright guys, I'm happy with the way that came out. These are all fairly close in length. I mean, a couple of thousands would be the most they're off. The next thing I need to do is neck it down. Uh, I'm going to be turning it down to, I believe this is an inch and a quarter. Uh, this is a prototype that I made out of smaller stock just to kind of get the feel for what it's going to look like when I'm done. Now, I don't need to have all of these precise. They don't need to be within thousands as far as tolerance but I do want to machine these back to roughly the same area. So what I've done is I've taken black magic marker and just went around roughly where the one inch mark is. And instead of using a height stand or anything sophisticated, I've taken a piece of wood. I'm going to take a razor blade and take two push pins. And this piece of wood is cut to one inch. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark this. And I don't know how well you're going to be able to see that, but it's marked all the way around. And I'm having a hard time seeing it myself because of the sunlight, but if I take it away from the camera, I can definitely see that there's a mark there. And I'm going to repeat this process on the other two. Alright guys, let's take a look at the prototype. Now, this part down here, this is not to scale. This is. Uh, this is a 7 8 diameter bore, and I'm going to drill in to this stock roughly an inch. And then I'm going to leave, or taper this down to an uh, inch and a quarter, which leaves me a fairly decent sized wall. Now, some of you know that I'm not the most, um, well, financially gifted person in the world, but uh, I believe in making do with what I have. And on a previous video, I showed drilling through aluminum with a Forstner bit. Now, I don't have a, um, a 7 8 drill bit that's uh, good enough to drill this hole, and I certainly don't have an end mill. So I'm going to go ahead and use the Forstner bit. I've already tested it, and I know it works. For lubrication, I'm going to be using Tapmatic cutting fluid, which is specifically for aluminum. Now, this is not a cutting oil, it's a cutting fluid, but it's still going to provide me some much needed lubrication throughout this process. Now, this is going to be a very, very slow process. I've got my hole drilled, and I brought the drill bit out just until the edge. And I'm going to use this as somewhat of a makeshift steady rest, because I don't want to have this move at all. 
This isn't exactly the most precise lathe in the world, but I'm going to throw a little bit more fluid in here, so that's going to act as my lubricant, and it's just more or less to make sure that this doesn't move a whole heck of a lot. Now I'm going to go in with a regular high-speed steel cutting tool, and I'm going to take this section down one inch back, down to, I believe it's an inch and a quarter. Anyone in the mood for aluminum linguine? Well, one down, two to go. Uh, I'm going to do all the cleanup on this after I verify that they all match. So that way I'll just come in and chamfer these edges just a little bit. And we'll go over to the milling machine from there. So I'm going to cut the other two off camera and I'll meet you over at the mill. I got the first piece set up in the chuck. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to machine one flat on each piece, then I'm going to flip it over, reset the height of the mill, and machine the second flat. And I'm going to be doing conventional milling uh, only. I'm not going to be doing any climb milling on this. This is a fairly large end mill. I'm not sure exactly what size it is, but uh, it's a large end mill and it's a small mill. So I'm going to do conventional milling because I know from my experience with this particular mill that there's less vibration. first pass on all three pieces is complete. I have added a parallel to the vise. That way the work is sitting up higher than the vise jaws, so I don't have to worry about crashing into the jaws, which is always a good thing. Tighten that down. And I did just climb mill, uh, even though I said I wasn't going to do that. But this cutter is so sharp and the aluminum is cutting like butter, I'm not getting that much vibration at all. So I am doing a combination of climb milling and conventional milling to get the parts done. I finished machining my two flats. Now I want to drill a hole through the flats and I need to find the center line of this piece. Now this is two inch aluminum round and I did take a caliber to it and it is fairly accurate. It's only about five thousandths out from a true two inches. Now I can mark my center line with my age old and proven technique with a razor blade, a piece of wood and a magic marker. But I do have some better equipment that uh, used to belong to my father. This is an aerospace grade uh, lab plate that we actually used when we were working in the aerospace industry. Um, they certified this to be very, very tight in tolerance. And I have my Sterrett satin finish height gauge. So we're going to mark these lines out with a little bit more class than just uh, your average run of the mill razor blade here. So I am going to use my favorite mark out uh, fluid though. I am going to use a magic marker. And I'm going to be using an angle plate. I'll hold my piece flush against my angle plate. Move this out of the way. Actually reposition a few things here. Now I've already set my height stand to one inch, which is going to be my center line. And now I'm just going to scribe a line.
All right, here we go. Now that I have my layout lines established, I have the piece back in the vise and lined up and ready to drill. Uh, you guessed it, this is an inch and a quarter Forstner bit. I am going to be using the Forstner bit to drill this hole. And because it is a large bit compared to the size of material that I'm drilling, I do not want it to crash into the vise or into a set of parallels. So I'm using a piece of starboard, uh, HDPE, high density polyethylene. So if the drill, and I know it is going to go through the metal, it will not come into contact with another metal or hardened surface, it will come into contact with the plastic. Is it as perfect as a parallel? No. But the saw cut that's on this particular piece of starboard came from a manufacturing facility that has a very, very precise um, a cutting saw, and it's usually accurate within plus or minus five thousandths. So I'm pretty confident that this is going to be level enough to get my job done. Oh man, well YouTube, that was quite an ordeal. Um, I ended up shutting the garage door, it may seem like it's a little darker over here, it is. Uh, I shut the garage door because this thing was chirping so loud that uh, I'm sure my neighbors could hear it. They're outside playing with their kids, so I shut all the doors, sacrificed a little bit of light, but I'm you know, trying to be courteous to other people. I mean, it was really, really chirping. I even went out and got my uh, my hearing protection. But um, this method, while it is not ideal, it does work. I've got two more to do. Uh, I know the piece in the vise right now is going to be hot, so I'm not going to take it out and show you. Uh, I'm going to go off camera, quench it real quick, just throw it in some water, and then I'll be back. Well, there's the part. The hole looks good. I like the spacing of it. It's right where it's supposed to be. So I'm going to go ahead and drill the next one, which is already in the vise. The next step in this project is to drill the holes. Now these holes are going to be a number seven drill bit, or I think the fractional is uh, 13 64ths for that. I'm going to be drilling three of those holes. Uh, two of them are going to be through the body itself, and then one is going to be for a set screw on top. And I've already got my first piece set up inside the mill. I'm going to go ahead and drill it out. With the holes drilled, I'm going to go in and put countersinks on the two main body holes. Those are going to have standard Allen head screws. The top piece does not need to be countersunk because that's going to have a set screw, so that's going to be below the surface anyway. So we went from this to this. And that fits pretty good. All right, guys, as you may have guessed, the next step is to tap the holes. Now, I've got my spring-loaded center inside of an R8 collet in the mill, and that is right over my tap handle, and my tap is already in the hole. I've got just enough pressure to compress the spring a little bit, and I'm ready to start tapping the holes. Uh, if you're interested in learning on how to make a spring-loaded center, just search for the video title, Making a Spring-Loaded Center for the Lathe, and you should find this on my channel. All of the pieces are at the same point, and I'm ready for what's going to be the most nerve-wracking part of this entire project. This is something I have to do on the bandsaw. And the bandsaw, uh, the vise really doesn't hold parts this small, and I need to cut along these lines. And what that's going to do is it's going to break this main body into two pieces and allow it to become a clamping mechanism. So let me get this set up in the bandsaw and you'll see exactly how I'm going to have to cut this. What I've done is mounted a drill press vise to a piece of aluminum channel stock 
which allows me to change the orientation of how things are held inside of this bandsaw. Uh, I am using my horizontal metal cutting bandsaw because it's a lot more accurate than the wood cutting bandsaw that I do use to cut metal on sometimes, but I need as much accuracy as I can get out of this. The trick is I have to keep an eye on this side of the cut. Because the blade is at an angle, the blade is going to reach the bottom of the cut faster on this side than on this side. So it's going to be an incomplete cut, and what's left on this side I'm going to have to cut with a hacksaw. But this will get me most of the way through, and this will make sure that everything stays straight. As you can see, this cut goes all the way down to the reference line on this side, but because of the angle of the blade, it doesn't quite go down. I don't know if you can even see the reference line on this side. There it is. Um, that's all going to have to be cut by hand. Yes, I can flip it around in the saw and bring this cut down to the line using the saw as well, but uh, I'm just going fin to finish that off by hand. It's not very much. And what I'm going to do after that is have one cut coming down this way and that will bring this whole piece uh, away from the main body. Now once this is off of here, what I can do, the holes that I drill extend almost to the outside of this. It's very, very close to the outer wall. It's going to give me the opportunity to come in here with a tap and make those threads longer than what they are now. So that's how I plan to deal with that problem because my tap is not two inches long. I'm going to do the other uh, vertical cuts off camera and when I set up to do the last cut here I'll come back and show you how I set that up. Just because putting a vise inside a vise wasn't sketchy enough we're gonna put a vise inside a vise inside a vise. Well, there's the result after my first cut. Pretty happy with that. Although I'm going to have to do a lot of saw work on the back of this by hand. Um, I'm going to go ahead and cut the other two off camera and I will be back. Not bad. The next thing I'm going to do is take these over to the drill press and I'm going to drill out the threads and I'm going to be using a 1764 drill bit. Now the reason I'm going to do that is because the threads are already started on this side. This does not need to have threads. In fact, I drilled one out already and it's going to be more of a floating piece. This is the part that's important to have the threads because that's what's going to draw all this together. But putting threads in here too, it's just redundant and it's not really going to work as well. Okay YouTube, I'm going to set this up with another sacrificial piece of starboard. And that'll do two things. One, it'll set it at a nice height for me in the vise where I can see everything. And two, if I drill into it by accident, I don't care, it's plastic. And it's not going to harm the vise, the bit, or the part. Uh, I am, like I said before, drilling this hole up to a 1764 which is one fractional size bigger than a quarter inch. Now these uh, screws that I'm using, these Allens, are quarter by 20, so this will allow them to slide back and forth freely, but it won't be sloppy.
All right, guys, as you can see, this sits relatively flush, moves freely through the piece, and I'm happy with that. Now, you may have noticed while I was drilling, this vise was kind of jumping a little bit. This drill bit came in a set. Uh, it was a 115-piece drill bit set that I bought off of eBay for, like, 20 bucks. And my first thought was, well, how bad could they possibly be? Uh, they're bad. They're really bad. With all the drilling and cutting complete, it leaves me free to come back in here and use a bottoming tap to complete the threads and the main part of the housing for this piece. That I'm going to do off camera. Alright guys, after a quick trip through the sandblaster just to kind of dull the finish a little bit, want to try to make it match the existing aluminum that he already has on the boat, it's ready to be delivered to the client. Now I do have to make a riser piece and I have to make another uh, aluminum adapter on top, but it's all the same operations that I've already done. In fact, it's going to be a lot easier because I don't have to cut this out. The other piece is just going to be a through hole with a set screw, which is going to be 10 times easier than doing what I just did here. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, thank you for coming along for another one. And I do have a question that I want to pose to the YouTube community. Now, I've been watching different channels. Um, I watch Alex Steele, I watch Jimmy Duresta, uh, I watch Mr. Pete, I watch a lot of other people out here on YouTube. And my question is, what do you find more, uh, well, I don't want to say more educational, but what do you have a, a more of a value with? Do you like the videos where it's just a fast-paced sequence that shows a project coming together over a period of time? Or do you like the videos like I do, or like Mr. Pete does, or A-Bomb, where they sit down and actually explain the process and draw things out to really go in depth to explain how you can accomplish this stuff at home? Anyway, that's my question. Just kind of curious. Leave me a comment below. Thanks again for stopping by. This has been Jeff at Dark Moon Metals. I'll see you again soon.